mine. Oh. Damn, it wasn't that bad, man. Give me a chance. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Dr. Ryan here. Uh, today, we're talking about constrictive pericarditis. I hope you're well. This is an outline of what we're going to be chatting about today. We're looking at a handy clinical case. Then we're covering chronic constrictive pericarditis and looking at this clinical entity, teasing it apart. We're looking at etiologies, signs and symptoms, investigation, treatment modalities, a differential diagnosis, and complications. And then, of course, we're ending off with some scripture. All righty, all righty, all righty. Are you ready? Let's get my pointer in there. So we've got a 35-year-old woman today. Ha! Huh? Admitted to hospital with malaise, weight gain. Increasing abdominal girth and edema. The symptoms began about three months prior and it gradually progressed. The patient reports an increase in weight, uh, right? The swelling in her legs has gotten increasingly worse, such that she now feels that her thighs are swollen as well. She has dyspnea and exertion and two pillow orthopnea. She has had significantly a past history of Hodgkin's disease, diagnosed young at the age of 18. Right. She was treated at that time with chemotherapy and mediastinal irradiation. On physical exam, when you see her, she has temporal wasting and appears chronically ill. Her current weight is 96 kilograms, an increase of 11 kilograms over the past three months. That is quite significant. Vital signs are normal. Her jugular venous pressure is elevated at 16 centimeters and neck veins do not collapse on inspiration. Aha! Heart sounds are distant. There is a third heart sound shortly after aortic valve closure. The sound is short and abrupt and best heard at the apex. The liver is enlarged and pulsatile. Ascites is present. There is bipedal pitting edema. Echo shows pericardial thickening, dilation of the inferior vena cava and hepatic veins, and abrupt cessation of ventricular filling in early diastole. Ejection fraction is 65%. What's the best approach to treatment at this point? Is it A, aggressive diuresis only? B, cardiac transplantation, C, mitral valve replacement, D, pericardial resection, or is it E, pericardial synthesis? Hmm. Okay, guys, what really is chronic constrictive pericarditis? Uh, it's a disorder characterized by progressive thickening, fibrosis, and calcification of that big old pericardium. Commonly involves the right side of the heart. Now, just two points about this, guys. Remember that pericardial disease exists on a spectrum. So what starts off as acute pericarditis has the potential to develop a pericardial effusion, which chronically can give you constitutive pericarditis, all right? And uh, remember the right side of the heart handles volume well. It doesn't handle pressure well. But the left side of the heart handles pressure reasonably well, right, but doesn't do well with volume. So in chronic constitutive pericarditis, because of the ungiving pericardial wall, right, the right side of the heart decompensates very easily. And often we have bowing of the septum to the left, and you have passes paradoxes. Okay, where does this fit into the grand scheme of things? Here is our broad approach to pericarditis, and I will post a link in the description box below to the video breaking down pericarditis. But essentially, pericarditis has numerous etiologies, right? There's infectious, malignant, connective tissue disease, cardiac, metabolic, and other. But the main cause of constrictive pericarditis worldwide is TB, all right? So that comes under your bacterial etiologies. Right, but in countries with a low prevalence of TB, malignancy-associated pericardial disease is very common, and that comes in three flavors, metastatic, reactive, and primary. What are the signs and symptoms we get in constitutive pericarditis? Nice to ask. Now, most symptoms are due to systemic venous congestion, which is basically the hallmark of chronic constitutive pericarditis, and symptoms include weakness, dizziness, anorexia, nausea, and vomiting. Cough, dyspnea, and exertion, which we have to create according to the New York Heart Association scale. There may be orthopnea and paroxysmal maternal dyspnea, abdominal swelling, and later on, ankle swelling. But note that SITs or abdominal swelling with relative absence of peripheral edema is a big tip off because only later on does ankle swelling happen. Signs we look for is tachycardia with a low volume pulse. And we spoke about pulses paradoxes, and the pathophys there is that. Because of the rigid pericardial sac, the right heart enlarges at the expense of the left heart. And this bowing of the septum, so there's diminished left ventricular output during inspiration. Okay, and that's what gives us the 
uh, process paradoxes. The juggler venous pressure is raised. You may have a rapid wide descent. This is what we call Friedrich sign. And of course, we have Kussmaul sign, which is an increase in the JVP or inspiration. Normally, the JVP goes downwards in inspiration, right? Um, but here it goes upwards. You may determine uh, whether the patient has a pericardial knock, which is a third heart sound attributed to rapid ventricular filling, and enlarged tender liver, ascites, and peripheral edema much later on. So these are the signs in summary. So remember, the patient may appear cachectic. There's a passus paradoxus, and passus paradoxus speaks to a uh, uh, fall in the uh, systolic pressure by more than 10 mils mercury, or the fall rather in the arterial pulse pressure by more than 10 mils mercury on inspiration because increased right ventricular filling compresses the left ventricle, we have bowing of the septum to the left, etc. We spoke about that. You may have hypotension. The jugular venous pressure is raised, we spoke about Kussmaul sign, a prominent X and Y descents, which speaks to brisk collapse during diastole. The apex speed often impalpable. On auscultation, heart sounds are Early third heart sound, early pericardial knock because rapid ventricular filling is abruptly halted. Then hold to monitor now. <laughs> yeah. The abdomen, you have hepatomegaly due to raised venous pressure. So you may have splenomegaly because of raised venous pressure and ascites. Peripheral edema later on. And the causes we mentioned here, but by and large, TB, very common in our setting. Don't forget neoplastic disease, previous metastinal radiation, connective tissue disease, CKD, uh, cardiac operation or trauma as well. So causes of constricted pericarditis, uh, so we said infection being TB or Coxsackie, hemopericardium, which can be attributed to trauma, myocardial rupture, post-infarct, and dissecting aneurysm. Don't forget about your collagen diseases. Rheumatoid arthritis can do this. Open heart surgery, mediastinal radiation as an our clinical case. Drugs like dopamine, agonists like cabergoline. Fungal infections like histoplasmosis really after acute puddle and pericarditis that often manifest with pericardial effusion, right? Or it could be an idiopathic flavor. Please note that calcification commonly involves right side of the heart and can be seen by fluoroscopy. The calcification does not always mean constriction. Sometimes you can just have pericardial calcification on its own. And rheumatic fever does not, does not cause chronic constricted pericarditis. Now, what are the complications of chronic constricted pericarditis? Well, it can manifest with atrial fibrillation in 30% of cases, ascites we know, as well as myocardial fibrosis. How can we investigate someone in whom we suspect has constricted pericarditis? So first up, start with chest x-ray. You do a posterior anterior view and a lateral view, which shows a relatively small heart and pericardial calcification can be seen in some 50% of cases on a plain X-ray film. ECG is going to show you a low voltage tracing with tachycardia, sometimes T wave inversion. Right? This is different from elliptical alternance that we see in the case of pericardial effusion. Echo is the main investigation. So it's going to show you a good old thick calcified pericardium, small ventricular cavities with normal wall thickness. You may see a large atrium dilation of the inferior vena cava, abnormal septal motion, and immobile heart. All right. Kind of Doppler is going to show reduction of flow along the mitral valve and pulmonary valve during inspiration, and we see the opposite during expiration. CT scan of cardiac MRI is also helpful. Cardiac cath is going to show you diastolic pressure is going to be equal in the left and right ventricles, and uh, in diastolic pressure is equal in the left and right atrium. Other investigations as per the cause, so it's good to do um, gene expert, if you do a, a, a sputum for gene expert, do a rheumatoid factor, antinuclear factor, or do a, um, a metastatic screen. Endomycardial biopsy may be necessary really to differentiate from restrictive cardiomyopathy in difficult cases, which is a differential for chronic constrictive pericarditis. So how are we going to treat chronic constrictive pericarditis? The only thing which offers relief, really speaking, is surgery. So complete resection of the pericardium, helpful in 50% of cases. If TB is responsible for this presentation, pericardiectomy with anti-tuberculous drugs. If there's no calcification, only anti-tuberculous drugs should be given. Right? In that if there's no calcification, there's no need for a pericardiectomy. If hemodynamic status of the patient deteriorates after four to six weeks, pericardiectomy can be done at that point. And to treat and address the primary cause. After surgery, persistent constriction and myocardial fibrosis may be present, and atrial fibrillation often uh, you know, will occur post-recovery as well. The differential diagnosis for chronic constrictive pericarditis is only two flavors, restrictive cardiomyopathy and congestive cardiac failure. And sometimes the only way to differentiate constrictive pericarditis from restrictive cardiomyopathy is to do an endomyocardial biopsy early. These are the features in terms of differentiating 
uh, congestive heart failure con from constrictive pericarditis, okay? Uh, so we look at uh, six parameters. Breathlessness is more common in heart failure, uh, not common at rest, but does occur on exertion in con chronic constrictive pericarditis. We do not have a process paradoxes with uh, run of the mill congestive heart failure, but you do have it with chronic constrictive pericarditis. Looking at your jugular venous pressure, it's raised, but there's no cusmal sign in CCF, but it's raised with a cusmal sign and with a prominent wide descent in pericarditis. In congestive heart failure, we have cardiomegaly present on the chest X-ray and clinically, but it's absent in pericarditis. Uh, in congestive heart failure, edema. We said the big tip-off is when peripheral edema occurs. So in congestive heart failure, that peripheral edema is an early feature, earlier than ascites. But in congestive pericarditis, the ascites appears early and edema is a late feature. On auscultation in heart failure, a murmur may be present, but in congestive pericarditis, a pericardial knock is indeed present. Right. The other differential is, um, I beg your pardon, there's a typo here. This is cardiomyopathy, guys. This is indeed cardiomyopathy. Restrictive cardiomyopathy versus constrictive pericarditis. And the big way to differentiate these entities as follows, right? So look at these six parameters. So in terms of the apex beat, it's not felt with uh, constrictive pericarditis, but it's well felt in restrictive cardiomyopathy. The heart itself is normal and pericardial knock is present with pericarditis, but with restrictive cardiomyopathy, the heart may indeed be enlarged. You may have left ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular failure may be present. On ECG, constrictive pericarditis gives you a low voltage tracing and tachycardia, but restrictive cardiomyopathy often gives you a bundle branch block and the Q wave may be present. Uh, the echo in chronic constrictive pericarditis, you will see definite changes in that uh, pericardium, uh, but in restrictive cardiomyopathy, the myocardium is thick. On color Doppler, we see respiratory variation in, um, you know, atrial venous flow, but in restrictive cardiomyopathy, there's no change. CT or cardiac MRI will show you a good old thick calcified pericardium with constrictive pericarditis, but you'll just see a thick ventricle, not necessarily calcified in restrictive cardiomyopathy. Okay, guys, back to our clinical case. We had quite a bit of info here. We had a reasonably middle-aged lady who presents with malaise, weight gain, increased abdominal uh, girth, edema. She's had this for three months. Uh, she's increasing in weight, has now got uh, ascites as well as peripheral edema. She has dyspnea, orthopnea, previous Hodgkin's, which was treated with chemotherapy and mediastinal irradiation. And she has a whole lot of clinical signs, that including a raised JVP, distant heart sounds, third heart sound, okay, which is probably a pericardial knock. The liver is enlarged and palsatile. There's ascites, there's edema, echo shows pericardial thickening, dilation of the IVC, hepatic veins, uh, EF is 65%. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? Pericardial resection, all right? So this patient's presentation and physical exam findings are most consistent with the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. The most common cause worldwide is TB. Don't forget malignancy and autoimmune disease as well. Most likely radiotherapy has caused this in this particular clinical scenario. Pericardial resection is the only definitive treatment of constrictive pericarditis. Diuresis and sodium restriction may uh, assist in managing volume status preoperatively and with significant ascites, you want to do a paracentesis as well. Okay, my friends, today we're talking about prayer. In the book of 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Paul admonishes Thessalonians by saying, Pray without ceasing. Do not stop praying. In Ephesians 6.18, yeah, Paul says, uh, pray always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. All right. And um, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. We are called to pray. There's not a single day that we live that we live independently of God. Approach the Father, bring your needs, bring your anxieties, bring your concerns before Him. Allow His peace to fill your heart, and He will undertake for you, my dear brother and sister. God bless you. Have yourself a fantastic day. Here are my references. I'll see you soon. We're going to be talking about pericardial effusion in the next video. God bless you.